Today we're going to be talking about the different types of problems that people have that are associated with fear and anxiety and stress and distress. And in DSM-5, they put those all together. As I said, it's been sort of reorganized. And so our topics today are a lot. So we're going to be going pretty rapidly here to get these all in. But anxiety disorders, obsessive compulsive disorder, orders that deal with trauma, adjustment, and disassociative disorders. But what's in common? They all have to do with experiences that people have in the past or experiences they're having right now that have to do with fear or anxiety. Now, what's the difference between fear and anxiety? Because sometimes we don't really think about that. Let me give you some definitions here. Fear is an emotional response to a real or perceived imminent threat resulting in a surge of autonomic arousal necessary for fight or flight. So do you see the fear is current right now? Okay, it's happening or it's imminent. Anxiety is an anticipation of future threat or the ominous sense of being menaced by an unspecified threat resulting in muscle tension and vigilance and cautious or avoidant behavior. Now, what is stress? The way I like to talk about stress is, stress is when your demands exceed your capabilities. See, if you've got it pinned down and you've got this all working, are you going to be very stressed? But if you see that, wow, I don't know if I can handle this, in fact, I'm sure I can't handle this, then how much stress are you going to have? So it depends on your perceptions. Do you notice that? In fact, in all the things we're talking about, it depends on our current perceptions or our past perceptions of certain events and certain things that are going on. Now, how are anxiety disorders different? Well, they differ from normal fear and anxiety by being excessive or persistent beyond which is normally expected. So it's not an anxiety disorder if you're about to be in a car wreck and you have fear. That's normal fear. It's when your fear is excessive and beyond that that we're going to be looking at today and talking about those particular things. The first one we're going to talk about is separation anxiety disorder. And that's about 4% of children. It can be even in adults. Developmentally, inappropriate and excessive fear or anxiety concerning separation from attached persons, including three of the following. Recurrent excessive distress when anticipating or experiencing separation from the home or a major attachment figure. This is the clingy kid that's holding on to mom all the time and following mom from room to room. Persistent or excessive worry about losing a major attachment figure or harm to them. Persistent or excessive worry about an untoward event like getting lost, getting kidnapped, being in an accident. Persistent reluctance or refusal to go out away from home to school, to work or elsewhere because of fear of separation. Fear of being alone or without major attachment figures. Reluctance, refusal to sleep away from home or to sleep without the attachment figure. How many clients do you think you're going to get? They're going to say, well, yeah, I know my kid's eight, but he's still sleeping with us. Yeah, you get those kind of things. That's what this fits into, those kind of problems. Repeated nightmares about separation. Repeated complaints of physical symptoms like headaches, stomach aches, nausea, vomiting, when separated. In this one particular orphanage in India that we've been working with, uh, one of the children there was really acting out, and it was hours when their major attachment figures had gone on a trip. So you see how that would fit into this kind of thing. Fear, anxiety, or avoidance is persistent, lasting at least four weeks in children and adolescents, and typically at least six months in adults. Clinically significant distress or impairment, not another mental disorder. 73% in twins. 
So do you see this is inheritable to a certain degree, especially after a loss? And we're going through a lot of these today. The next one is called selective mutism. I have a girl that I'm counting right now that was sort of like that. She's getting out of it, but she would come and she would almost never say anything. And if you asked her a question, she would just sit there and look at you and be thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking and you got nothing out of her. Uh, now she's actually doing better. Now sometimes she'll wait 30 seconds before you get an answer, but at least it's not totally mutism. And it's that selective mutism. That's because it's only in certain situations. This isn't a person that's totally mute. Consistent failure to speak in specific social situations despite speaking in other situations. Disturbance interferes with education or occupation at least one month. Not a lack of knowledge of the spoken language, not a communication disorder, autism, or a schizophrenic spectrum disorder. Almost always another anxiety disorder, such as social anxiety disorders associated with this. Now specific phobia. What's a specific phobia? This is seven to nine percent yearly. People have a specific phobia of some sort. Ever hear of arachnophobia? What's arachnophobia? How many of you have a fear of spiders? Raise your hand. <laughs> especially ones that are poisonous. But it would have to be excessive, wouldn't it? There are over 126 different specific phobias. The word phobia in the Greek is fear. Marked fear or anxiety about a specific object or situation, like flying, heights, animals, injection, blood. The stimulus almost always provoked immediate fear or anxiety. The patient either avoids the phobic stimulus or endures it with severe anxiety or distress. The fear is unreasonable or out of proportion. That's important. If it's a fear of a rattlesnake that's about ready to strike you, is that a phobia? No. But if you just have a fear of all snakes because you had a problem in the past, that could be a phobia. Patients must have the symptoms for six months or longer. Clinically significant distress or impairment. The symptoms are not better explained by another anxiety or mental disorder. And there are specifiers. Remember the specifiers? Those are things you add on to make them clear. Caused by animals, caused by natural environment, caused by blood injection, injury, situational or other. So you specify what is causing the phobia. Now we have social anxiety disorder. Marked fear or anxiety about a social situation when exposed to scrutiny by others. With children, it must occur in peer settings, not just with adults. Fear is negative evaluation. Situation almost always provoke fear or anxiety. Situations avoided or endured with intense fear or anxiety out of proportion to the actual threat last at least six months or more clinically significant distress, not a substance mental disorder or a mental condition, two to six times higher in adults. Interesting thing, unemployment can be a predictor of this when people are unemployed. Now we have one that you're going to hear quite a bit about. The rest of these you're going to get some people here and there, but this one you're going to hear quite a bit about, and that's panic disorder. Now realize you can have a panic attack without panic disorders. So you're going to hear more about panic attacks and things like that. But a panic disorder itself is 2 to 3%. And it can be a specifier or another mental disorder. Reoccurrent unexpected panic attacks. The patient suddenly develops a severe fear or discontent that peaks within about 10 minutes. Now listen to these characteristics, because they specify a lot, and these are the things that you're looking for. Palpitation, pounding heart, or accelerated heart rate, sweating, trembling or shaking, shortness of breath or smothering sensation, nausea or other abdominal discomfort, dizziness, lightheadedness, faint or unsteady feelings, chills or hot flashes, choking sensation, numbness or tingling, 
derealization or depersonalization, fears of loss of control or being insane, fear of dying, followed by one month or more of the following, worry about additional panic attacks and their consequences, change in behavior related to attacks such as avoidance of exercise or situations, not a substance medication or medical condition, not other mental disorder. 8% of girls after puberty, 2 to 3% of adults each year, fear of having another panic attack or withdrawal, two times higher in women. 36% say they have mild panic attacks, and it can be accompanied by agoraphobia. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but in the past, it was specific with panic attack with agoraphobia was a diagnosis, and now those are sort of split up. It can also be caused by mitral valve prolapse, thyroid disease, irregular norepinephrine, fear of sensations of more attacks, inadequate coping skills. So there are a lot of different things here, but what really is it? It's a very interesting phenomenon because what's going on is that the person has something that triggers a fear. And because they trigger a fear, it makes the body react in some way. Like a person, their heart starts beating faster. Well, now that their heart's beating faster, what do they say to themselves? Wow, there must be a problem here. But because now they believe there's a problem, what does their heart do? Beat faster. So now they know they really have a problem. So now what happens? Their heart beats even faster. And so it's a loop that you get into by monitoring your own reactions, and it gets worse and worse, and pretty soon, because the person's so sure they're going to die, they start hyperventilating, so now they start fainting, feeling like they're going to faint, and pretty soon they know that they're dying, and they're in this huge panic. And they call the ambulance, and they get there, and they're sitting in the waiting room, and they feel just fine because these things don't normally last more than about 10 minutes or so if the person will just get through them. A lot of people with panic attacks believe that if their heart beats too fast, they're going to die. Well, if that was true, all athletes would die. <laughs> and so there are a lot of lies that go along with this and different panicky things even from the past that triggers this, but you just have to realize and help them realize, no, they're not going to die. No, this is not some huge disaster or some huge catastrophe that's going on. But see, all of these things deal with fears, don't they? So we're going to have to deal with the fears. Agoraphobia. It means fear of the marketplace or fear of venturing out into public places. The patient has anxiety about being in a place or a situation, including two or more of the following using public transportation, being in open spaces like parking lots, marketplaces, bridges, being enclosed in places like shops, theaters, or cinemas. How many of you have ever felt enclosed in a place and you just got freaked out? Now that's another type of phobia, isn't it? It's called claustrophobia. Standing in a line or being in a crowd, being outside of the home alone. They have individual fears or avoid these situations because escape could be difficult or embarrassing or help might not be available. That's what's going through their head. They almost always provoke fear. Fear is out of proportion to the danger. The patient avoids the situation or places and endures them, but with a material distress. They require a companion when in the situation. Last six months or more, clinically significant distress or impairment, other mental disorders or medical conditions don't explain the symptoms better, and they could be diagnosed along with a panic disorder. General anxiety disorder. And anxiety disorders, by the way, are the most common type of disorder that there are. Excessive anxiety or worry for at least six months about a number of events or activities. What's different about this one? Generalized. See, we had specific phobia. We had other types of phobias and other problems, didn't we? But this is generalized. It means they're afraid of a bunch of different things. The patient has trouble controlling these feelings. 
the association with this anxiety and worry, the patient has three or more of the following symptoms, some of which are present for over a half of the days in the past six months. You only need one of these symptoms if it's a child. Feeling or being restless, edgy, keyed up, tired easily, trouble concentrating, irritability, increased muscle tension, trouble sleeping. How many of you ever had any of those symptoms? How many of you ever had anxiety? But there's another thing that's not mentioned here in DSM-5 that we call an anxiety attack. How is that different from a panic attack? In the panic attack, the person's afraid they're going to die and that kind of thing. Anxiety, you just feel your chest is tight. You just have this strong anxiety that something bad is going to happen. The symptoms cause clinically significant, important distress or impairment of work, social, or personal functioning. A disorder is not directly caused by medical condition or substance or medications. It does not occur along with another mental disorder. Uh, appears in childhood or adolescence, 3.8% of the population. Majority also develop another anxiety disorder, usually developed due to exposure to real danger. So where is this anxiety going on? How about the client that you've asked in the question? Do you always feel that the other shoe is about ready to drop? See, that can be a generalized anxiety disorder. I know something bad's going to happen. Yeah, everything's going good right now, but I'm still anxious because I know it's not going to keep going good because in the past when I was a kid, this bad thing happened and that bad thing happened and that bad thing happened. And so I've got fears in a number of different areas to give this diagnosis. Can result from pairing, modeling, or wrong thinking. It also can be a problem with a GABA neuron inhibition failure. It's the least responsive to treatment of the different anxiety disorders we just talked about. 27% are treated. You use stress management, fear. Xanax is used a lot for, you hear people that just get addicted to Xanax because anytime they have an anxiety, they just drop a Xanax pill and keep doing it. It does help uh, significantly. Of course, we also have anxiety disorders due to other medical conditions. And anytime we're dealing with medical conditions, what are the requirements? The first one is they have to have some sort of a medical way, a lab test or something that says that physically they have this problem that can cause that particular thing. Or they have to have a history. So you have to be able to tie it to a particular medical disorder. It's not delirium. It's clinically significant. Specifiers, limited symptoms attacks, general anxiety, specific cultural syndrome. And of course, we have other specific anxiety disorders and unspecified anxiety disorders. Our next topic called obsessive compulsive and related disorders. This is another one that you're going to see every so often. Uh, The suggestion is 1.2% of the population deals with this. How many of you ever saw the movie The Aviator about Howard Hughes? That is an example of an obsessive compulsive disorder and how much it can really mess a person up. It has a lot of talents and a lot of things in their particular life. The presence of obsessions or compulsions or both. What's an obsession? Persistent thoughts, ideas, impulses, or images that seem to invade the person's consciousness. Not about real problems, but feel intrusive. Attempts to resist and ignore causes more anxiety. Obsessive doubts, themes of dirt or contamination, violence, orderliness, religion, or sexuality. Worry they will act out on their obsessions, but usually don't. Most people just dismiss intrusive thoughts, guilty about the thought, and try to neutralize it. They many times have a depressive mood, a strict code of acceptability, dysfunctional beliefs about responsibility and harm, think they can harm others, they think they can and should be able to control all of their thoughts, very suggestible, uh, abnormally low serotonin activity. So that's the first thing. So what's another term for that? Worry. 
Your thoughts just go around and around and around. And you can't get them out of your mind. So what does a person do about that? How do they cope with that? Well, many a time they cope with compulsions. If I just do this, in the religious realm, I had a client that because he felt he would be separated from God if he didn't do everything perfectly or confess it, he was confessing his sins for at least eight hours a day. Now, why was he confessing his sins for eight hours a day? That was the compulsion. If I just confess everything, then I will be okay and I will be close to God. Do you see the wrong thinking also that's involved in that? And so you have to sort of find out why. But you'll find that the compulsions can be many other types. Compulsions, repetitive and rigid behavior or mental acts that a person seems compelled to perform in order to prevent or reduce anxiety or stress. Used to reduce anxiety, cleaning, checking, symmetry, orderly or balance, strict rules, verbal rules. So what's the idea? If I can just have control of my life in this one area over here, at another obsessive compulsive person, and we kept changing as we would get better. It turned out that the real issue, the fears were about his codependent marriage. So when his marriage wasn't doing good, he would have to have something in control. First it was he had to feel perfectly. So anytime he didn't feel bad, he went to the doctor. And then it was his glasses. He had his glasses exactly straight. So he was going to the person to correct his glasses and straighten his glasses about three times a week. And then it was candy bars. And finally, it was getting those little stuffed animals out of the machine. He had a whole trunk full of stuffed animals. But do you see, they were always to be in control in this area over here, which helped him to control the anxiety that was in his mind. They were all sort of distractions. And there are all these different varieties of these particular things that you can see. Obsessions and compulsions are time-consuming, more than one hour a day, or clinically significant distress. No substance or medication or mental disorder. Specifiers with good, fair, or poor insight. Many times they don't even realize why they're doing this all. Absent insight or delusional beliefs can also be associated with a tick disorder. Onset is usually between 14 and 35 years of age. Notice this, suicide attempts in 25% of cases. Low serotonin activity and abnormal activity in two parts of the brain. The brain does not shift well. See, for a normal person, what's going on? A thought comes into your mind and you're not stupid, you just throw it out. Or a fear comes to your mind, you just deal with it and go on with your life. It's like they get into gear and they can't get these thoughts out of their mind. So some of their attempts to fix themselves then are the compulsions and the other things that they do or make yourself a black and white world because then it's easier to control that and therefore you can control your thoughts. So you see the combination of these things that are going on. Anifril and Prozac seem to help in about 50 to 80% of cases. Here's another one, and most of these we don't really associate directly with OCD, but they still have fears, and the person is reacting to the fear in a certain way, so that's why they're in this same category. And this one is body dysmorphic disorder. Again, that's 2%. Preoccupation with perceived defects or flaws in physical appearance that are not observed or seen by others. Repetitive behavior like checking the mirror, excessive grooming, skin picking, reassurance seeking, or mental acts, comparing in response to concerns, clinical significant distress, not body fat or weight, or an eating disorder, specifiers with muscle dysmorphia. Yeah, there are people going around that are because they think they're wimps and they don't have big muscles, that, that can be part of this with good or fair or poor insight, with absent insight or delusional beliefs. A person can just believe that they're ugly and they're going to act that way. Had an interesting one just recently. The person believes they have an odor. No one can smell this odor. Because what did I say? 
Get a deodorant. <laughs> but that didn't do. <laughs> that wasn't a good enough answer. See, the person sees there's something wrong with their body, and because of that, they hide out, and they don't go to places, and they don't do things. Here's a new one for DSM-5, hoarding disorder. Had a client like that just this last year. Two to six percent. I remember this one particular time when I was younger that uh, I was on a mountain climb with the Sierra Club and uh, this lady gave me a drive home and I walked into her house and the house was just solid with car parts. I mean, the, uh, every table was covered with different car parts and everything. You couldn't walk except for one little trail through this entire house. Of course, I wasn't a counselor at the time, so I didn't tell her she had a hoarding disorder. <laughs> but that's what they're talking about. Persistent difficulty discarding or parting with possessions regardless of value. Difficulty due to perceived need to save the items and distress discarding them. Results in accumulation that congests or clutters active living area and interferes except for the interventions of third parties. I had one person coming in. We worked with this lady, and they just got a truck and went in there and emptied out her house, and uh, we made rules about what she could buy, and the main rule we had was what? You can't buy anything until you discard something. You only have so many items that you are allowed and you have to uh, get rid of something before you can get anything new. Because she was on the internet and so on, just buying stuff all over the place that she didn't need. There was stuff with boxes that were never opened and everything else just piled up. And this was an older lady, so how do you think that did with her finances? But you see the kind of problems. Clinically significant distress, not another medical condition or mental disorder. Specifiers. With excessive acquisition, with a good, fair, or poor insight, with absent insight or delusional beliefs. Here's another one, and you might see this one also. Trichotillomania. That's hair pulling, 1 to 2 percent. Reoccurrent pulling of one's hair resulting in hair loss. Repeated attempts to decrease and stop hair pulling do not work. Clinically significant distress and impairment, not a medical disorder. But why are they doing it? See, that's the question what I was asking about. Because it's a tension release. They have sort of a fear, and when they pull the hair, somehow it releases tension. And excoriation. That's skin picking. Had a client like that this year. 1.4%. Reoccurrent skin picking resulting in skin lesions. Repeated attempts to decrease or stop. Clinically significant distress or impairment. Not a medical condition or uh, anything else. It's just the way that this tension sort of builds up and they just sort of have to pick their skin. But you, can you see how those all look a lot like OCD, don't they? The person has a fear and somehow or a tension that goes on and somehow by doing some compulsion, something that they have to do, it relieves the fear or the anxiety or the thing that they have going on. So do you see how these all fit into the same category that we're talking about here? And of course we have substance-related induced OCD and uh, related disorders, OCD and related disorders due to a medical condition, other specified OCD and related disorders, and unspecified related disorders. Now we have another category, and these are all separate in categories in DSM-5, trauma and stress-related disorders. How are these a little bit different? It's an event that has occurred that has now created the fears and the fears are dominating the situation, but the fears were created by some trauma or some stressor-related thing that is happening or is happening in their life at that particular time. Now, we're going to go down really to the young age here. This is very interesting because in the past, this was all lumped into one category, reaction attachment disorder. Less than 10% even in severely neglected children. 
So all children do not get reaction attachment disorder just because they're in an orphanage and they're not paid attention to. But about 10% or less do. Consistent pattern of inhibited, emotionally withdrawn behavior toward an adult caregiver manifested by both. You have to have both of these. Child rarely or minimally seek comfort when distressed. Child rarely or minimally responds to comfort when distressed. Persistent socially or emotional disturbance characterized by at least two of the following. Minimal social or emotional responses to others. Limited positive response. Episodes of unexpected irritability, sadness or fearfulness that are evident even during non-threatening interactions with adult caregivers. The child experiences at least one extreme of insufficient care. Social neglect or deprivation, this is in the past, uh, lacking basic emotional contact, stimulation, or affection. Repeated changes of primary caregiver limited stability attachments. Rearing in unusual settings that limit attachments, like institutions with a few caregivers per child. I had an instructor when I was getting my first degree many years ago, and they had adopted a girl from Bolivia. And when this girl arrived, she didn't even walk. She just scooted around on the floor and picked up crumbs. And when they would pick her up and try to hold her, she would scream and fight. And they had to use holding therapy for a year, for eight hours a day of just holding her, screaming and fighting, trying to get loose till she would give up, until they finally were able to attach with her. And you probably even read that in the news and so on, there have been cases where they tried to do that kind of therapy and people were suffocated and other things like that. So this is a very serious type of thing. And what's serious about it is it tends to lead to oppositional defiant disorder and conduct disorder and other personality disorders, especially antisocial personality disorder. So it can be a whole type of thing. But all kids don't react in the same way. And by the way, it has to be evident by age five. Poor care is assumed to be the cause. Development age of at least six months. Specifiers are persistent. That means it persists for at least 12 months or severe. That means all the symptoms. But now we have a new category in DSM-5 again. And this category is disinhibited social engagement disorder. What do you think that means? Less than 20% of even severely neglected children have this particular thing. But if we add those two together, we've got about 30% of severely neglected children that have these disorders. Child actively approaches and interacts with unfamiliar adults and exhibits reduced or absent uh, reticence uh, in approach and interaction with unfamiliar adults. Overly familiar verbal or physical behavior that is not consistent with culture or sanctioned or age appropriate. Diminished or absent checking back with adult caregiver after venturing away, even in unfamiliar settings. Willingness to go off on an unfamiliar adult with minimal or no hesitation. It's not limited to impulsivity, say like an ADHD but includes socially inhibited behavior. Child has experienced a pattern of extremes that is insufficient care, just like we did in the other category we were talking about. And poor care is assumed, development age of at least nine months, persistent at least for 12 months. So what are we talking about? Ever see these kids that just run up to everybody, go all over the place? So can you see the extremes that have been caused by this? In one case, they want no one to do with anything. In the other case, they're so desperate for need and support that they just go after everybody. So do you see how this all is a reaction to the past? And probably the most usual one that people think about is post-traumatic stress disorder. 3.5%, high anxiety and depression following trauma. Active stress of up to 28 days, post stress afterwards. 
8.7% in the lifetime, 10% in serious traffic accidents, 19% of rape victims attempt suicide, according to one study. 97% of people who have been in concentration camps have PTSD. Of course, we think about it as what? Soldiers coming back from combat. But it can be a lot of other things, and you're going to see it also can be just because people have seen other people go through stress that you can get PTSD. Exposure to actual or threatened death, serious injury, or sexual violence in one of the following ways. Trauma experience, witnessing the event, learning the event to a close family member or friend, repeated or extreme exposure in adverse details. You hear about it over and over and over again. The patient has experienced or witnessed or was confronted with an unusual trauma event that has both of these elements. One or more symptoms of the event in at least one of these ways. Intrusive, distressing recollections, repeated distressing dreams, disassociative reactions through flashbacks, hallucinations, or illusions, feeling or acting as if the event were reoccurring, that's called ab reaction, including experiences that occur when intoxicated or awakened. Marked mental distress in reaction to internal or external clues that symbolize or resemble some part of the event, in other words, triggers. Psychological reactions such as a rapid heartbeat, elevated blood pressure in response to these cues. Uh, the patient repeatedly avoids the trauma-related stimulus and has numbing of general responses. Absent before the traumatic event, as shown at least one of these, tries to avoid feelings, thoughts, or conversations concerning the event. Tries to avoid activities, people, or places that recall the event. Negative alterations of cognitive or mood association with the traumatic event uh, begins or worsens after the event as evidenced by two of the following. Now, do you notice something here? If you ever looked at DSM-4 before, they've increased the number of criteria here very significantly from what was in DSM for DSM-5. So they've got a lot more experience and they've tied this down a lot more in these criteria because they just sort of go on and on and on here for quite a while. Cannot recall an important feature of the event. Persistent and exaggerated negative beliefs or expectations about the self, other, or the world. Distorted cognitions about the cause or the consequences of the trauma blaming themselves and others. Negative emotional state, fear, horror, anger, guilt, or shame. Markedly diminished interest or participation in significant activities. Feeling or detachment of estrangement. Inability to experience positive emotions. What's that all about? One of the rules is if you kill your negative emotions, you also kill your positive emotions. Now we have another list here. Alterations in arousal or reactivity associated with the event, including two of the following. So you've got quite a few criteria here you've got to meet before you really can say you have PTSD. Irritable behavior or angry outbursts with little or no provocation, typically expressed as verbal or physical aggression toward people or objects. Reckless or self-destructive behavior, hypervigilance, exaggerated startle response, problems with concentration, sleep disturbance. The symptoms above have lasted at least for one month. The symptoms cause clinically significant distress and impairment not a substance or medical condition, specifiers with disassociative symptoms, depersonalization, derealization, with a delayed expression. They can have increased arousal, anxiety, and guilt, even the guilt that they've survived, affected by childhood experiences, personality, and social support. So if you take all those, how much of a problem does a person have with this? But remember what's the critical thing here. It has to have lasted more than one month. Okay, the normal response that people have to trauma, if it doesn't recover in one month, it means they got locked into it, right? 
Well, what is it if it lasts less than one month? And that is what we call acute stress disorder. Same criteria, only it's in the time period from the trauma to one month. If it goes past one month, you now have PTSD. Now we have another category. And all of these have to do with stress or fear or trauma. And this is the one that is used probably the most in diagnosis because you're going to find out later on we try to give the easiest, nicest diagnosis we can give that meet all of the criteria. And this is called adjustment disorders. Within three months of a stressor and in response to it, patient develops emotional or behavioral symptoms. Either of the following demonstrate the importance. Distress markedly exceeds the normal expected. So if it's just a normal symptom to a stressor, is it a mental disorder? No. It has to be more than the usual that you would expect. Materially impaired job, academic, or social functioning. Not another mental disorder, not normal bereavement. Doesn't last longer than six months after the stressor is removed. Now this is critical. Because many times, especially insurance companies are going to say, well, you've given this diagnosis of an adjustment disorder and they're having family problems. Well, it's only supposed to last six months. What's the answer? The stressor hasn't been removed. They're still married. They still are having whatever the problem is. So adjustment disorders can go for a long period of time. It simply means there's a particular problem and they're having a hard time adjusting to it. And the specifiers are with depressed mood, with anxiety, with mixed anxiety and mood, with disturbance of conduct, with mixed emotions and conduct, unspecified, such as job problems, physical problems, social withdrawal, acute problems, other specified trauma or stress-related disorders or unspecified trauma or distress-related disorders. But what happens if somebody is really traumatized in a very heavy way beyond anything the average person would ever experience, even in a war type of situation? They can develop another category, and this category is called disassociative disorders. What's a disassociative disorder? It means that the person is sort of protecting themselves in some way and disassociating, changing their identity or changing something in their life or how they react in order to react to this. Realize that you also can have disassociative amnesia, which we'll talk about in a little bit, which means what? You're blanked out. You don't even know that particular part of your life exists because it's so stressful that you can't emotionally handle it and so your body blocks it out. So in very distressful situations, the classical one, of course, is uh, satanic ritual abuse and things like that that are just beyond anything that you can imagine that can cause these kind of things. But they can be caused by lesser items too. The first one, and this used to be called multiple personality disorder. What does it mean? It means the person's personality is fragmented into several different personalities that switch back and forth. But the correct term for that is disassociative identity disorder. A number of identities control the individual's behavior, 1.5%. Some people try and suggest, well, there are all these people that have this. Uh, the suggestion is really clinically 1.5%. Patient has at least two distinct identities or personality states. Each of these has its own pattern of sensing, thinking, or relating to self and the environment. Interesting line. I'm going to read it to you directly. It could be described as possession in other cultures. What are they talking about? If you have possession and you have some demonic force and it is now expressing itself, is that another identity? Yes. So they're saying you have your identity and you have the demonic identity. So that's why this is categorized under disassociative identity disorder. Notice they suggest other cultures. I'm not sure that's exactly the case uh, with this issue. At least two of these identities repeatedly assume control of the patient's behavior. Common forgetfulness cannot explain the patient's 
extensive inability to remember important personal information. A person like this, you might see them in one session and you're talking about them and they're acting totally one way and the next session they don't remember anything about the previous session and then they're acting totally a different way. People have even been known to have two different wardrobes or several different wardrobes in their house and they act different, they do different in everything. But this splitting of personality is normally due to excessive, really strong trauma. Clinical significant distress or impairment not directly caused by a substance use or medical condition, not part of a broadly accepted or religious experience. Because where could this be? How about when you have, uh, say, Native Americans with peyote and other things like that? Would, could they get into those kind of disassociated states? Not substance or other medical condition. Over 70% attempt suicide. Did you hear that? So if you're dealing with somebody like this, what is your probability that you need to deal with the suicide issue? Now we have disassociative amnesia that I mentioned a little bit. Inability to recall important autobiography information, usually of a traumatic or stressful nature. Clinically significant distress or impairment, not substance, medication, neurological or medical condition, not DID, PTSD, acute stress, somatic conditions and neurological condition, and not disassociative fruit. What's disassociative fruit? They actually go someplace, take another identity at some other place. A little example of this is there was a particular lady and she was, you know, remember she had a good Growing up, she was doing just fine. But one day, her daughter gave her this one look. And all of a sudden, that one look triggered because that was the same look that her best friend gave her as her father was killing her best friend. She hadn't remembered anything about this. Her father was a pedophile who had abused all of her friends. And that just triggered and went back. And she had buried all of that in amnesia. She couldn't, didn't remember any of that at all until that trigger. They checked into her. Her father went to prison for life. But she hadn't remembered any of it because that's how horrifying it was. Her body just blocked it all out. Now we have depersonalization and derealization disorder. 2% lifetime, but most times it's transient. Presence of persistent and reoccurring experiences of depersonalization, derealization, or both. Depersonalization, experiences of unreality, detachment, or being an outside observer with respect to one's thoughts, feelings, sensations, and body reactions. How about people that have other experiences, like a near-death experience? That would fit this particular category, wouldn't it? Because they're seeing themselves from outside of their body. Derealization. Experiences of unreality or detachment with respect to surroundings. Individuals or objects are experienced as unreal, dreamlike, foggy, or lifeless, or visually distorted. Reality testing remains intact. They're not in the psychosis. Not a substance, medication, or mental disorder. And of course, we also have other specified disassociative disorder and unspecified disassociative disorder. So those are quite a few different areas that can be affected by fear and anxiety, right? How about spec? Let's go look at how much of this is spiritual. We can have quite a bit of this can be spiritual, can't we? Especially when we talked about disassociative identity disorder possibly being spiritual possession and other problems like that. And spirits can take advantage of this thing. Physical, a number of them, remember, had fairly high levels of, if it's in your family, you maybe have it, that type of a thing. Experiences, that's what causes all of the trauma type of thing that you have. So experiences are very high, and then the choices that we have. Now, how about the Bible? What does the Bible say? I'm afraid I don't have enough time to go into this in depth, but basically, what does the Bible say? It says that, what is the opposite of fear? Faith. What casts out fear? Perfect love. The more I trust in God, the more 
I believe in him, the more I'm going to overcome my fears. And I face my fears a little at a time as I trust in God and my faith grows and my fear decreases. If I concentrate on my problem, what happens? The problem gets bigger and I get more afraid. If I concentrate on God, what happens? I see God is bigger and able to overcome my fears and able to make my life work out and therefore I'm going to overcome my fears. Probably the greatest area where Christian counseling has an advantage over secular counseling is this particular area. Because we can believe that God is on our side. We can believe he has our best interest in mind. We can believe we have unmerited favor and that God is going to work everything for our good, right? And therefore, you can be very effective of dealing with the kind of stuff that we just talked about today. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you that you are our God and that you haven't given us a spirit of fear. But Lord God, that you have always said, and throughout all the Bible, you always said, fear not. And Lord, we don't need to fear because we know you, because we love you, and because we know how much you love us. And we give you all the glory and all the honor in Jesus' name. Amen.